over the past several years, uh, men's sessions like this have changed a little bit from when I was a teenager as a freshman in high school, going to Steubenville's, uh, one of my freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, I went all four years of high school, and even as a youth minister, these sessions have taken on a different character over the past several years. When I was a teenager, we would get into a room that was never the main room, it was always a side room with really poor lighting, and they told us that that was chivalrous and that was the good thing to do. So the girls stayed in the main room with all of the cool stuff, and then they put us into a room with nothing, and we're like, guys, are visual, aren't they? I'm like, there's nothing on the walls. This is like the most boring space ever. And then we got yelled at for an hour about how terrible we were. And the, your youth ministers are laughing because they remember these sessions where it's like, stop sinning! You're terrible! And we were like, I am so terrible. <laughs> the girls, meanwhile, the women at the women's session were told that they were beautiful princesses, that they farted perfume, and they were just amazing. <laughs> so we all came out of the men's session like, oh my gosh. I'm going to hell. Like, there's just no way around. Like, that's, it's over. And the girls are like, I am perfect. <laughs> Here's the problem with that, is that women aren't perfect. They sin just like we do. And in those sessions, they never heard anybody proclaim truth to them. And for men, we heard about what we were not supposed to be in some very specific ways. But those sessions oftentimes weren't about what it meant to be a, a man of God, what it meant to live into a masculine identity. They didn't touch on that. It was just sort of stop, no, don't, don't do these things. Now go ahead and feel terrible about yourself and that should lead you to repentance. But here's the way I think. I'm a very goal-oriented person. And when I think about my life and who I want to be, I asked you who you want to be in 10 years and where I want to be, I then work backwards and start to say, what do I need to do to get there? Because I know that I can't just wish to be somewhere or to be somebody or to act a certain way and have it happen magically. Life doesn't work that way. If I want something, if I want to be something, I have to work towards it, and that has to start today. So I think about where I want to be, and then I work backwards. Well, what do I need to do to get there? I'm going to put forward a theory for you, and you have experienced this. Maybe you've never said it explicitly, but you know that it exists. You've probably heard the phrase toxic masculinity, and toxic masculinity without a doubt exists. The trick with toxic masculinity is the same culture that calls it out is doing things to produce it. And we've experienced the symptoms of what toxic masculinity are. And I'll tell you what, if I were to give you the, the playbook for destroying men in our country and therefore destroying men in our world, and by doing so, destroying our world and creating a culture, a culture of toxic masculinity, which does exist, men who are toxic, here's the things I would do. I would get a whole generation of men hooked on video games so that they fought their battles there instead of out in the real world. And I'm not talking on video games. I have friends who are professional gamers. I get that whole industry. It's a good hobby. It's a fun thing. But I'm talking about people who, like, that's what they do, or, like, that's what they're immersed in. I would get him hooked on social media, scrolling endlessly all day, so his intellect diminished. And if you're wondering if the intellect and the intellectual pursuits of men are diminishing, here's some statistics for you. Women are more likely to graduate from college than you are, and that number's increasing and your number is decreasing. Women are more likely to go to college than you are. So people, us, men, we're choosing not to go, and their number continues to increase, which is a good thing, but our number continues to decrease, which is a bad thing. And this doesn't mean that we're going into the military or into trades. You're not doing anything. We're not doing anything. Just scrolling. I would convince young men that faith is feminine. That's something your grandma does. That's not a masculine thing. That's a feminine thing. You don't want to be too faithful because it's tied to this next thing that you shouldn't have close relationships with people or be vulnerable, particularly not your father. And that's probably another thing I would do is I would destroy fatherhood and make sure that an emotional attachment between a father and a son didn't exist. Now, maybe you've got a good relationship with your dad and praise God for that. But you may have a relationship with your dad that was similar to mine. My dad's a good guy. He's a kind man but he's not an overly emotional person. I know he's an emotional person. I know he cries. He just never lets me see him cry. When I left to move to Arizona, he said goodbye and walked into the corner of the garage so he could cry with nobody seeing him. And it's not as his way, I guess, but I would make sure that that doesn't exist to make sure that men are emotionally stunted. I would make sure that men have a constant access to pornography to stunt their sexual relationships and their sexual identity. 
That's the next step I would take. Making it almost impossible and intimidating to talk to somebody in a romantic way or to understand how to have appropriate relationships and boundaries with people, drawing them back into themselves so that they weren't able to experience real love and real intimacy. And this would probably produce men who were self-serving and pleasure-driven, looking for the immediacy of the moment and if they couldn't get it withdrawing. People who sought to tear down others because they didn't know how to build things up themselves. Men who were prideful and thought that the world revolved around them and then were frustrated when they didn't get what they want. Men who were intellectually stunted and unable to ask big questions and dream big dreams and solve big problems. People who become apathetic to the needs of the world around them and ultimately even abusive. And that's toxic masculinity. But my plan for how I would do that, well, that's already being done, isn't it? And that's why I say you've experienced it and you know it and it's been made implicit in your lives, but I've just made it explicit. Now, I don't want to go so far as but there's a conspiracy to destroy men that's overt. But is there a spiritual battle being waged against you? Absolutely. And here's why. God created us with intentionality. In the book of Genesis, the very beginning, it says God created man in his image and likeness. And when it says man there, the Hebrew is referring to humanity. So you could read it as God created humanity in his image and likeness. And that distinction is important because of the next line. Male and female, he created them. Which means that when you take the masculine and you take the feminine and you bring those things together, you have an image of God in the world. That's pretty profound. That when taken together, men and women reflect who God is in an incredible way. And that means through living into a masculine identity, beyond cultural stereotypes, beyond what different you know, people say a man and woman should be, just taking the masculine and the feminine identity, bringing them together, you see who God is. So let me ask you this question then. What happens if you destroy just one side of those things? What happens if you say, let's just erase this one? Now we're giving the world an incomplete and distorted image of who God is. I would venture to go a little bit farther and say that many of the challenges that we face in our world, the brokenness, uh, the destructive forces that exist in our world have happened not because of evil men, but because of apathetic, and I'll add this caveat to it, Christian men because of apathetic Christian men who either sat back while bad things happened or maybe perpetrated some of those bad things themselves. There's this old phrase that goes, the corruption of the best things creates the worst things. And again, you know this to be implicitly true. Like for lunch today, if I was like, hey, we're gonna have, uh, I just got a bunch of Little Caesars hot and ready pizzas. Or Taco Bell. Now, maybe you think those things are gourmet, but let's call a spade a spade. It's not. And then right before we went to eat it, I had a bucket of those salmon heads that uh, Father Mike had, to, had in his like, box last night, right? And I dumped it all over the food. You'd probably be like, oh, man, that's disappointing. But really, was it going to be that good to begin with? And didn't we just save the plumbing of this facility? Now imagine that you are out with some of your friends celebrating a big accomplishment and you're gonna sit down to a really good, expensive steak dinner and right before you eat it, somebody comes and dumps fish heads all over it. Probably a little more upset because the corruption of the best things creates the worst things. The corruption of men who have the cap capacity to love, to be strong, that God created us that way. Again, in God's image and likeness to reflect certain masculine qualities of who God is to the world. The corruption of the masculine identity creates a toxic masculinity, which is one of the worst things that our world can experience. Instead of being creative, it is destructive. But I have an idea. I think that you, this generation of young men, I think that your eyes are open to some of this. I think that your eyes see the world in a profound way, that you see through some of this garbage and some of these lies, that you know that there's something more that you can do and that you can be. There's a profound power that exists within your generation. And I believe that this, young, this generation of young men, I think that you can bring a healing to the world if you are willing to rise up to the challenge that's given to us through Jesus Christ, the ultimate example of what masculine identity can look like. 
And there's one particular account that I want to walk through. Because I've been thinking and praying, like, where is something that would just exemplify what, it, what, what could it look like if we lived this particular way as men in our world? And I found it. It's in John chapter 8. And it's an account that maybe you've heard before. Maybe you haven't. So if you've heard it before, as always, anytime I read from Scripture, I want to just invite you to go into the story and hear it like you're hearing it for the first time. And if you're hearing it for the first time, perfect. So this is the beginning of the Gospel of uh, John chapter 8, if you want to go back and find it. And it's a story about a woman that's been caught in the very act of adultery. This is how it starts. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came into him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such a woman. What do you say about her? They said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the eldest. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus looked up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. And do not sin again. Go and do not sin again. Now, a couple interesting things happening in this account. Jesus is teaching as Jesus does, and he goes into the temple. So this is a crowded area that Jesus is in to teach. And when Jesus is teaching, he's teaching in a rabbinic style, which means he's sitting And there's a circle of people sitting around him to hear him. So he's not like I am with a microphone on a stage proclaiming things in the temple. Imagine like he's in with a group of people. It's a busy temple area. So people are probably crowded kind of close to Jesus to hear his teaching. And it's probably a sizable crowd. And you know that when there's a crowd, more people gather to the crowd to see what's going on. So imagine Jesus sitting in the center of a group of people who are all huddled close to him. He's in the middle and they're listening to him teach. That's the style. That's what would have been happening. Now, you have a woman who's been caught in the act of adultery. There is no need for a trial here. This has been witnessed. And imagine that if, again, if this has been witnessed, she was caught in the act. She's probably naked, ashamed, and scared. And some people, when they read through this particular scripture passage, will point out here uh, that, you know, where's the guy? Because he has also committed adultery and should be stoned to death. And so I want to present a a, a view of this, right? Now I want you to imagine, the one case would be like, one possibility is that the guy was let off the hook, right? I don't think that's accurate for a couple of reasons. First is that in Roman law, Roman law was actually a little bit stricter when it came to this sort of thing. The punishment in Roman law also was that a person stoned to death for adultery. That's breaking a marital bond that's breaking a legal agreement. But you were not allowed to stone the woman if you didn't also stone the husband. So if people are not, the, stone the, uh, the man. So the, that, this is how it stayed fair, right? You couldn't just target somebody. It's like, well, if the charge is adultery and the sentencing is, is stoning, they both need to be stoned. In fact, if you stone the woman and not the husband, you then are in trouble with the law. So I'll put this forward to you. Where is the man? I bet he's dead. I bet this crowd stoned him to death. And here's why that's important. Because you have a bloodthirsty crowd who has already done part of the deed because they know that in order to stone this woman, they had to stone him first. So this woman's terrified because she just watched this guy get stoned to death. But now they're going to use her as an example because they want to not only stone her to death to fulfill the law, they want to trap Jesus because they know that Jesus proclaims love and truth and compassion. And so if they're going to bring her to Jesus... Now he's got a choice, because if he says you can't stone her to death, he's in violation of Roman law and Mosaic law. And so can you imagine this woman, terrified, ashamed, and they bring her to Jesus and put her in the midst. So remember, Jesus is teaching in a circle. So now this woman is in front of Jesus in the middle of a circle of people in a crowded temple, ashamed, naked, scared. And they use her to test him. 
What Jesus does here is an example of authentic masculinity. He's presented with a challenge. And how does Jesus react? Angrily? Without thinking? Emotionally? Does he get frustrated? He's calm and collected. Too often, we allow our emotions to drive our response. Because we're not taught as men emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is understanding my thoughts, my feelings, uh, my immediate reactions. Where do those things come from? Like, when's the last time you sat down and said, I feel sad today? Why do I feel sad today? This is high level stuff. Not a lot of people do this in general. So I'm telling you, if you start to do this, you will be profoundly powerful because you will be able to control your emotional responses. Why am I angry? Man, what that person said just really made me mad. Like, I want to punch them. Wait a second, why? Jesus is calm and collected, but powerful. And so, he writes with his finger on the ground, and they continue to ask him. And then he stands up and says, let the one who's among you cast the first stone. And he leans back down to write on the ground. Now here again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge you with this imagery. Where's the woman? In the middle. Where was Jesus? In the middle. She's right here, right? Now again, people, when they kind of do a little exegesis, a little interpretation of this passage, they're always like, what was he writing on the ground? I'll say it doesn't matter. He's just doodling. Do, 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 do. Which probably was frustrating to the Pharisees, right? Can you, like, have you ever talked to somebody and they're just drawing, like, doodling, like, they're not even writing things? You're like, are you even listening to me? That's Jesus. He's just so, like, in control. He's doodling on the ground. That must have been so frustrating. Yeah, let the one who's without sin cast the first stone. Here's where I think it gets interesting. So if the woman's here and Jesus has been teaching right here, he's not moved, he's only stood up. And he gets back down. When I'm here, if that woman's here, and I say, all right, if, if you want a stone or go ahead, the person who's without sin casts the first stone. If those people start throwing stones, what happens to Jesus? He's dead too. It's very likely that he's standing just about over this woman. And he's bent down on the ground, crouching, not covering her, but close enough to her that they know if they stone her, you're not that accurate with a stone. And this crowd's probably going to get a couple shots in on Jesus. And they'll stone him too. There's this cliched phrase we have. Uh, and it's a cliche and it's true. You know, Jesus, even if you were the only person on earth, Jesus would still die just for you. And we're like, okay, whatever. But there are a couple moments in scripture where that's true. And this is one of them. Right now, Jesus is prepared to die for this one woman. It happens again a few chapters later with Lazarus. Jesus raises this man named Lazarus from the dead. And immediately after that happens, the council convenes to figure out a way to put him to death. That one action, raising Lazarus from the dead, is actually what does Jesus in. So here's a few things we can pull from this account. Because Jesus then looks at the woman and says, where have they gone? And she says, uh, has no one condemned you? And she says, no one. And then Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and do not sin anymore. Who is Jesus as an authentic man in this moment, as revealing an authentic masculinity? He's in control of his emotions, but that doesn't mean that he's not emotional. He probably feels very deeply in this moment. Who is Jesus as a man in this moment? He's a protector. He feels compassion for this woman and he puts his very life on the line to stand in the middle so that people who wish to attack her would have to also go through him and harm him. Who is Jesus in this moment as a compassionate one who suffers with this woman? He also speaks truth. Compassion requires that we speak truth and we seek justice. So not only is he with her, literally suffering with her in this moment, but he's going to proclaim truth to her. He doesn't just say, hey, you're off the hook. Get out of here. He says, hey, no one's condemned you. I don't condemn you, but you don't sin again. Don't find yourself back in this position. Go and be free. As men, 
This authentic masculine identity is one that we can capture. I wonder what it would look like if you lived your life like Jesus in that moment. Because there are other men there too. There was a whole group of people ready to stone this woman. And sometimes as men, we get indignant and look for people that we can throw stones at. It takes the attention off us. It takes the, 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 our own attention off us. But then there was a whole other group of people there. They're not explicitly named, but surely they were there, who were in the crowd listening to Jesus teach. And as soon as this started to happen, they just got up and like slipped out the back. Like, I don't want any part of that. This is getting heated. This is getting weird. I'm just going to get out of here. And sometimes that's us too. Sometimes that's us too. Just like, hey, I don't want a part of this situation. I don't want a part of where the world's going. I'm just going to kind of step out the back. The thing is, to be a man like this, to be a man like this Jesus, there are a couple things we need to do. If you want to cultivate compassion and courage, that emotional control that allows us to feel powerful things, but to keep it under control so we don't fly out the handle and we don't fear our emotions, to be a person who steps into the center, there's a couple of things that we need to do. The first is that I want, I want you to ask yourself, where are you growing in faith and virtue right now? And where are you wasting time? To be that person, to be a person like Jesus in 10 years requires that you make an effort now. What are you doing to make that happen? No one just runs into a burning building. No one just puts their body on the line. It happens through little moments every day. Where do you make an effort to sacrifice for the good of others? Jesus is self-sacrificial, and so too ought we to be. But you have to do it in little ways daily. Where are you giving up comforts so that you're not a man who seeks immediate gratification, but seeks to delay and to sacrifice, especially for others? Does the time you spend in a day reflect your values? Where do you spend time and where do you waste it? Here's the next thing I want you to think about. In your life, where do you step into the center? And where do you step out to the edges? What moments and things in your life are you willing to step in and be like, no, you know what, this is, my dad used to say, whenever I'd pick a fight with him about something, he'd be like, is this really the hill you want to die on? Taking the van out on a Tuesday night to go get ice cream, this is why we're going to have an argument? And I'd be like, no, it's pretty stupid, you're right. What hills are you willing to die on? What battles are you willing to fight? Where are you willing to step up versus where are you willing to, or where are you stepping back when you shouldn't? I think there's a couple, a couple of areas come to mind where I think this is absolutely needed, and I've seen it go both ways. Right now in our country, the landscape regarding abortion has shifted dramatically. And that's... I think we would do well as Catholics to remind ourselves why that's important, why that's worth applauding. Because we believe that life is valuable, that life is sacred. I said last night, you're one in eternity. Every life is unique, unrepeatable, and that is worth defending, especially the most vulnerable lives. But as men, here's what happens in those situations. You are told that you don't have a voice in this matter, that you shouldn't speak into this matter. And so a lot of people are like, well, I'm on the edges. I'm just going to kind of back out of this one. But as Catholics, if we truly hold to the belief that all life is sacred, then we recognize that we have a profound and sacred duty to step into the center. And it becomes more critical than ever now because the truth of our world is that unplanned and crisis pregnancies will not stop. What are you as a man going to do about that when it's a classmate? that finds herself in a situation that is absolutely dire, that's scary. When she has people around her who are telling her that maybe she needs to cross state lines at this point, and they'll help her do that. Or you have people who are around her, and maybe you live in a state where abortion will continue to be legal up until term. And make no mistake, there will be states where that happens. They'll be called haven states, and they'll be celebrated. Right up until 40 weeks. What will you do? I mean, that's her, her call. Or, I can't believe you did that. 
I can't, you got yourself pregnant. No, you got yourself into this mess. You got to figure out this mess, but you can't go abort that baby. Because if you do, oh my goodness. I got a stone waiting. I know guys on both ends. There are fewer guys here in the middle. But I know them too. A couple of years ago, I gave a very similar message in New York City to a group of young men. And a couple of years after that, I got a message from one of them. He said, hey, remember when that, uh, you had that men's talk and you told us that when we were confronted with this situation, if one of our friends was confronted with an unplanned pregnancy, a crisis pregnancy, we need to be compassionate, but we needed to speak truth. We needed to journey with them, commit to the journey, walk with them, love them, care for them, but also support them in choosing life, speaking truth, right? I did that a couple weeks after that conference when my friend got pregnant. And the very next picture is a picture of her with her baby. He went on to tell me that she had planned to go terminate that pregnancy. But this young man who had the courage to step into the center, to not worry about what other people might say or how difficult it might be or how long the journey might be, walked with his friend. This is not his girlfriend. And clarify that. This is just a friend. Up until the moment she had that child. That's authentic masculinity. Authentic masculinity is stepping into the circle when we hear remarks that are disparaging or discriminatory. Stepping into the center when we encounter situations where we know that our friends, our classmates, people we are around are being pushed to the margins because of their race, their ethnicity, their socioeconomic class. Because if all life is sacred, their lives are sacred too. It's standing up against systems and powers and institutions that seek to hold other people back and strip their dignity. And being aware of where those things exist. There's this prophet named Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 17 through 19, Jeremiah gets this great call. God is asking him to do something. And Jeremiah's, he's nobody. But God makes him somebody. The people have lost their way. And not just the people, but the kings, the princes, the religious leaders. And God's calling Jeremiah to go and to do something incredible in this world where there are institutions that are bad and corrupt and evil and where evil men have taken hold. And this is what God says to Jeremiah. And I think he says it to you today. This is Jeremiah chapter one, verses 17. But you... Gird up your loins, arise, and say to them everything that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And I, behold, I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its princes, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. That's a great call. How could Jesus sit in that circle and kneel down by that woman, drawing in the sand, waiting for the first stone to be cast? It's because he was confident in the relationship he had with God the Father. That was not the appointed time. They'll fight against you, but they won't prevail over you. Where do you step to the center to practice compassion? And finally, how do you embrace brotherhood? You cannot do this alone. You can't. I can't. I have people who hold me accountable. My best friend, uh, a man named Jonathan, I've known him for years. We don't live in proximity. And you'll find this as you grow older and you leave your friends. A lot of your friendships right now are held together by proximity. You're close to one another. It's easy. You find out who your friends are when there's distance. So he lives in Illinois, I live in Phoenix, but we connect once or twice a week, get to do some work together. He's one of my best friends. We hold each other accountable, we check in, we call one another out, we call one another to more, we pray together. That type of accountability is critical. And here's the challenge. As men, we're not given an opportunity to do that. We have stigmas we put on, 
close relationships with other men. We have hurt that we try to veil because we've been wounded by people in our lives, that we push them at a distance. We were never taught what it looks like to have an emotional connection with somebody in a healthy way. But practice helps us overcome those things. Jesus had a group of close friends. And they didn't need to hold Jesus accountable because Jesus was perfect. I mean, I guess the one time Peter tried to hold Jesus accountable, he really didn't need to, and Jesus held Peter accountable. That's a whole different thing. But Jesus didn't minister alone. He had a group of people he surrounded himself with. And you have a group of people you're surrounded with right now. In a big way in this room. Because I wonder what it looked like if you could go back to your world knowing that you didn't stand in that center circle alone. But you were with, I don't know, probably 900 people here who are back home doing the same thing. And finally, how do you embrace prayer and worship? None of this is possible if you do not have a deep connection with who God is. To draw close to Jesus is to become like Jesus and to emulate his best masculine qualities. Humility, self-sacrifice, compassion, truth. To step into the center. I want to invite you to stand up. I believe strongly, and it's, the, it's really the only reason why I come to continue to do this ministry. I believe very strongly that you the, and your generation, the people who stand by me, this generation of men, you are poised to make a profound difference in the world. To build up and to overthrow the things that are not good. To spread compassion and care. To bring righteousness to our world. To stand in the center rather than sneaking out from the back. There are plenty of men willing to throw stones and plenty of men willing to just throw up their hands and say, well, it's not my problem. But not you. God's charged you with something different and me with something different. And the only way we do it is through prayer. Prayer is the school of sacrifice, right? Father Mike talked about that. Worship and sacrifice. So when we worship, there's a sacrifice that takes place. We're going to pray in two ways to close this session. The first way is together as a group. Oftentimes when we worship, like in our big assembly like this or a mass there are another probably 1100 women in the room supporting our voices so we don't have to sing out but not now and some of you have probably never heard what it sounds like to be in a room where the men of god join their voices to worship that's powerful so we're going to pray and i want to invite you into this and to push yourself a little bit in this prayer maybe that's the sacrifice There's no ego involved in worship because worship isn't about you and it's not about me. And then in a minute, I'm going to invite you to pray with one another. And for some of you, that might be new too. And so let's begin our prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.